Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone, and welcome to yet another in our series on metropolitan finance, a webinar series that we are um, jointly uh, delivering with the Lincoln uh, Institute of Land Policy and the World Bank. Uh, we are indeed going through uh, this book, path-breaking book, that looks at uh, metropolitan finance, um, an issue that is crucial to the development of our emerging cities. Uh, today, we are really privileged to have uh, Dr. Richard Bird, Professor Emeritus from uh, University of Toronto. Uh, let me give you, uh, you have it, but let me quickly read his bio biography and also provide with you, to you, um, a short snippet of what we will be addressing today. Uh, Richard uh, Bird is Professor Emeritus in e of Economics at the Rodman School of Management and adjunct professor and senior fellow uh, of the Institute of Municipal Governance and Finance, the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Uh, he is also a distinguished visiting professor at uh, the Andrew Young School of Public Policy at Georgia State University in Atlanta, an adjunct professor of the Australian School of Taxation and Business Law of the University of New South Wales in Australia. Uh, he has served with the Fiscal Affairs Department at the IMF that dealt a lot with the, these issues especially in the 90s, um, and has been a visiting professor in the United States and Netherlands, Australia, Japan, and India, uh, as well as a frequent consultant, uh, and I would add advisor, mentor, and friend here at the World Bank and uh, other national and international organizations. Um, Richard has uh, played a critical role in the development of this field. Uh, in public finance, local public finance, and uh, now in this uh, contribution of metropolitan finance. Today, uh, we will be looking at an overview. And uh, basically, we'll be th the, the synopsis is as follows. Mm, large metropolitan cities uh, differ from other cities. Uh, metropolitan public finance is also different because such cities spend more and differently than other cities and usually raise more of the revenue that they spend. Cities, like government structures within which they operate, differ substantially from country to country. So there's no single best way to finance their public sectors. However, as this session will discuss, there are a few general principles of which many countries could usefully pay more attention, such as thinking through carefully how best to balance central and local financial and fiscal responsibilities and accountability establishing more appropriate metropolitan governance structures and providing growing metropolitan areas with better ways to raise the funds they need to provide infrastructure and services. And that was very eloquent because that was written by Richard. And I'm very happy to have him now. We're going to go through a presentation. We will then go some, through some questions. And then uh, please interact. This is your session. You can ask questions and clarifications from Richard using the uh, infrastructure that we have here with us. Thank you, Richard. The floor is yours. OK, thank you, Victor. I'm very pleased to be here, and I hope that uh, we'll all learn something uh, today. This is a big subject about big cities. Uh, all I'm going to do in the relatively few minutes we have here is to talk a little bit about three questions, particularly the last of them. The first is, are metropolitan cities different from other local governments? And the answer is going to be yes, but we'll talk a bit about why and what that means. Secondly, how should we finance those cities? Um, you've already had some sessions dealing with parts of that, and there are more after this. So I'm just going to give you a, a brief introduction. And then finally, we look at some challenges generally facing metropolitan governments around the world in public finance terms and some of the possible solutions. So that's roughly the agenda. The first thing is this question, are metropolitan cities different? Well, yes, they are. They are big. You already know that. They're usually rich. Uh, and they're generally more heterogeneous than the countries in which they uh, are located uh, in terms of their uh, composition. In economic terms, they're big, powerful, rich, concentrated. Uh, they're therefore a major engine of economic growth. This has been talked about a great deal in recent years, but we know increasingly that the uh, in metropolitan agglomerations uh, are kind of the engines of uh, 
particularly this third sector, service sector, technological uh, growth in many countries. And it's something that everyone's interested in in developed and developing countries alike. And finally, politically, of course, because simply because they're big, simply because they're important, they matter a lot. In addition, they're also the often the capital of the countries in which they're located, though that's not true. In Canada, for example, our capital is, I think, the fifth or sixth largest city in the country. They also spend more. The per capita expenditures in metropolitan areas are generally higher for a number of reasons. They are, uh, well, it's not because they have more people. It's rather because they're, they're denser in population. They're more concentrated, which gives rise to certain costs. The buildings tend to be higher, which gives rise to certain other costs. Um, all of these factors are strongest in the central urban core of the metropolitan region in the central city. So that's important. On the other hand, the fact that they spend more doesn't matter that much because they also have a lot more money, or at least conceptually they can, because they have a larger economic base. Uh, they, uh, if they are allowed to do so, they can and should raise much of the money that they spend. They should also, generally speaking, be treated differently than other cities and local governments. One of the standard problems in the world, certainly a problem in my own country, is that we have a law that regulates local governments. The same law generally applies whether we're talking of a village of 200 people or a city of 20 million. This is a major problem for reasons we'll come back to and, and discuss later. Sometimes in some countries, cities actually uh, have different status. The, the metropolitan regions have different status. In China, for example, there are, are five large um, metropolitan regions in uh, um, Germany's uh, two cities, not all of them, but two, two large cities are, are separate regions. Uh, in uh, a number of other places, there are special capital districts, which are often the large metropolitan area like Mexico City and, and Colombia. Uh, there are um, a number of different political regimes within which metropolitan regions function. However, almost invariably, the boundaries of the political regime and the boundaries of the economic metropolitan region are not the same, and that's a problem. Um, they are also treated differently sometimes in terms of their revenue raising powers. Uh, and also, the other side of that, in terms of the amount of transfers that they receive from higher level governments. So they can be quite different in all sorts of ways. How they're financed is the, just like any other public finance issue, there's kind of three issues. One is what are their own source revenues? Um, and that has to be related to the, uh, the um, expenditure responsibilities which they have. When there's a gap between the expenditure responsibilities the cities are supposed to carry out and the amount of revenue they can be expected to raise on their own, they usually receive government transfers from uh, state or national level governments to help them do this. So that the issue of transfers, which you've already discussed, I think, in an earlier webinar, uh, is an important one with these local governments as with all others. And finally, a special issue in these areas is how to finance capital investment, something you're going to be talking about, I gather, in a later presentation. But we'll say a little bit about that here. Now, the first thing to be said, I think, is to make a very simple point. Uh, unfortunately, I pulled this material together just on the basis of what I happen to have on my computer. So the picture doesn't deal with a country that actually has a metropolitan city, but the picture uh, conveys an important message written in large letters on the slide, which says, neither their size nor poverty explains variations in revenue performance. That happens to be a little bunch of small municipalities in Sierra Leone. So it's not terribly appropriate for this particular presentation. But the point is nevertheless true, and I could show it for many other areas, that uh, you cannot confuse the amount of revenue which is raised by a locality, the amount of revenue in per capita terms which is raised by a uh, locality, whether it be a big city or a small one, and the amount of effort that is being made by that uh, that locality. So you have to be, when you're evaluating how well a city is doing, its revenue performance, you have to be aware of the fact that it's got not, it has relatively little to do with the size of the city. Uh, and we'll come back and talk about that a little later. So what are the sources of own revenues? Well, basically there's only two. 
you've got user charges and non-tax revenues. Um, and this is a subject I have worked on for many years, and I feel very strongly user charges are badly designed and badly used in almost every country in the world without exception. Much more can and should be done with respect to um, charging for local public services in ways that make economic sense. Very little is done along those lines. When cities, metropolitan areas have large non-tax revenues, it's usually because they have municipal enterprises, in uh, particularly in water, sometimes in electricity, in other activities, which actually generate a lot of revenue. Uh, but basically, this user charge non-tax revenue category at most accounts for 20% uh, of revenues in, in uh, well-run cities and often much less than that. Other than that, they have taxes. What taxes? Well, the main tax in most cities of the world is usually the property tax. This is not the only tax by any means, but it's usually the main one. And it's quite a good one. Uh, and that'll be discussed, I guess, in a later seminar too. But it's not easy to do well, and it's not easy to get a great deal of money from. And also, it's difficult to expand property tax revenues sufficiently quickly enough to meet the needs of a growing metropolitan area. So there's often a need for another revenue source to finance expanding services. Uh, and that's some sort of income, sales, or business tax. Now, in reality, how cities are financed varies enormously from country to country. Let me just give you two examples. The first one, uh, actually because I live in it, is simply my own. And if you look at this slide, which shows Canada, uh, shows Toronto, uh, you'll see the property taxes account for almost all of the local revenues. User fees are quite important in Toronto. This little thing down here called pills uh, are just trans uh, in Canada, and this is good practice, although few countries do it. Uh, national and provincial governments pay property taxes on their properties to local governments. So, but they don't pay the taxes, they actually pay a transfer in lieu of the taxes. But the idea is the same thing. Uh, other than that, you have conditional grants, which are quite important here, unconditional grants, which are not important, and that's quite different than in a lot of other cities, and no other big taxes. That's just Toronto. Now look at the next picture, which is quite a different one. That's Mexico. Now in Mexico City, some years ago, of course, we have a whole bunch of different taxes. I just put them on one by one taxes and non-taxes, because you'll see there are water charges and so on in there. Now, again, the major tax in Mexico City, just like Toronto, is actually taxes on property, taking two forms. There's a real estate tax, this one, and there's a pro uh, real estate acquisition tax, a tax on the sale of uh, real property. You add the two of those together, and 40% of the Mexico City's revenue comes from property taxes, which is almost exactly the same as in Toronto, interestingly enough. The, uh, on the other hand, Mexico City also has a payroll tax. This is a Mexican, uh, true of all Mexican uh, local governments. But it is uh, something which is rather unusual to have a payroll tax, which accounts for so much revenue as is the case in Mexico City. And next to that, uh, and water charges, the other tax, big taxes on vehicles. And again, vehicle taxes at the local level are not that important in many countries. They are a good revenue source, and Mexico actually exploits it. What they, these different cities do isn't really the point. The point is there's a lot, there are a lot of different things that cities can and do do in terms of raising their own revenue. Um, we'll come back and talk about how much they should be raising in the, at the end, I think. With regard to transfers, uh, there is a, a message that I think is important. Metropolitan cities generally receive less in transfers from the national government or the state governments than do other cities. This is not always the case. In Europe, in fact, it's sometimes the reverse. Sometimes metropolitan cities receive more because of their higher per capita costs of providing services. But as a general rule, they can and should receive less because they are more capable of raising more of their own revenue than other local governments because they have a much broader economic base and tend generally to be richer. So they, they, on the other hand, will still need a lot of transfers for various kinds of services, particularly with respect to uh, uh, infrastructure provision, which we'll come to next, but also because 
within the usual metropolitan region, particularly in developing countries, there are huge disparities. The differences between the rich and poor areas of different metropolitan regions is, are gigantic. And in some cases, in, in Chile, for example, and others, there are a lot of intermunicipal transfers which are intended to equalize these, uh, um, these differences in different uh, regions. Uh, one solution to that problem, uh, followed most, log most rigorously in South Africa, was to create a metropolitan regional government that encompassed a lot of rich and poor areas, and then to equalize the provision of services to an increasing extent within that area as a whole, while still keeping the, the revenues coming from the rich, but more of the expenditure being made in the poor areas. Now, that can be done, but there are other ways also of dealing with this uh, particular problem when it is a... Uh, uh, seen as something that should be dealt with. One problem that we have in all cities is that they are growing. The urbanization of the world is proceeding rather quickly. A lot of it is taking the form at the current time in many developing countries, as indeed was the case in, in the now developed countries in the uh, over the last hundred years of uh, people moving into the larger metropolitan areas. So you need to build new cities. At the same time, some of these cities are quite old. This is an example from one of the Canadian cities of a major collapse of a, a highway structure that took place a few years ago, which actually led to restructuring the, the entire um, infrastructure financing and transfer system in that, in that particular province. It's in the city of Montreal. Uh, there is a, a, this is what the city looks like, that's what parts of it look like. So many cities have that uh, kind of characteristic. They need to fix the old ones, expand, and so there's a lot of problems about financing capital investment. There will be a session, I think, in a later um, version of the, uh, I guess it's a session. There will be a later session in this uh, program where they're going to deal specifically with financing capital investment, but I'll just want to make two or three remarks about it here. First, uh, borrowing is a perfectly good way to pay for capital infrastructure. Um, the services of a piece of infrastructure will be received in future years. So it seems only reasonable that those who receive those services in future years should pay for them. It's both efficient and equitable if they do so. However, that raises uh, a lot of questions with respect to subnational borrowing, questions which have given rise to considerable concern in the past in a number of countries in Latin America and, and are today in, in a big issue in China, for example. So borrowing can be a perfectly good way to pay for capital expenditures, but it depends a great deal on the development of the financial structure and of the regulatory structure uh, in, in the country in question. And there's a an issue which I know the bank has been spending a lot of time thinking about, about the relative uh, role of rule-based and market-based uh, regulations on subnational borrowing. So that's an issue that more attention should be paid to. A second way of dealing with uh, financing capital investment is by sort of paying for it up front. Uh, this is through a method which is called, uh, in, in my country, development charges. In the United States, I think exactions or uh, other terms like that. Uh, in um, in uh, South America, it, it is often called um, valorization. But there are ways in which you can uh, sort of charge land developers up front, pay, make them pay in advance for infrastructure development that's going to service the housing or industrial use of their particular uh, piece of property. Um, this can be quite sensible. In a way, what you're doing is putting the, the borrowing load not on the public sector, but on the private sector. Uh, but you, and these things can be very difficult to develop and implement with care. But cities have indeed made considerable use of it. Um, there are a number of cities in Latin America that have done particularly good jobs with this. There um, is also a, a, an issue uh, with respect to public-private partnerships, which again basically shifts some of the financing, initial financing costs from the public to the private sector. But again, you have to be very careful in designing and implementing these programs. Um, you cannot replace a weak public finance management structure uh, 
by turning to the private sector in one of these ways, you need a good public financing structure in order to be able to turn to the private sector to work with you in developing these, uh, these kinds of systems. Uh, again, I, I, this is something that you will be talking about further, other Greg Ingram will be talking about later, I believe, but it's again something we can discuss a little further if you'd like. Now, this is the part I want to finish with and uh, spend another five minutes on, if I may. First, there, is, uh, there are a number of common challenges. One of the great problems you have in all subnational financing arrangements in many countries is that it's very difficult to understand exactly who is responsible for what and to whom they are accountable for whatever they do. So there's a great lack of clarity about this. This is a problem I'm, I'm currently reviewing a study of uh, these uh, subnational arrangements in uh, a number of Asian countries. And one of the problems is that it is uh, really, I mean, the constitution may say one thing, the laws may, may say another thing, the, or which is not quite the same thing. The actual way these things are implemented may imply something different. Uh, the reality may be something different again. It's quite difficult to figure out exactly what's going on here. This is the issue of matching authority, accountability, and incentives. Uh, and it is, uh, it is the major problem in the design of governance structures in general. It becomes more and more complicated as you, not more and more, but it becomes more complicated as you look at the uh, issue at the subnational context. It's particularly complicated in metropolitan areas. One of the problems that's universal is that central governments seem to have great difficulty in dealing with competent um, local governments. They say they, the problem is they don't have any capacity at the local areas, but they have a great deal of difficulty themselves in setting up structures that will generate uh, the information local governments need to do their job properly, that will be able to tell them whether local governments are doing their job properly. Uh, and there's a uh, sort of a general informational and institutional problem in the way we attempt to deal with these metropolitan uh, situations in most countries. A another common problem is that they really, big cities usually don't have adequate or sufficient revenue tools, let alone know how to use them. Uh, and so you get a lot of problems at the, on the revenue raising side and you have um, difficulties with respect to uh, the uh, that whole side of matters but it's all accentuated in many countries by fragmented local government structure you're going to be looking i think uh, i believe victor told me it was the next session on at sao paulo brazil which has a very fragmented government structure but they've taken a number of arrangements to attempt to coordinate activities more within the sao paulo region uh, and you know that's the kind of problem that that many countries have to deal with. A, uh, a particular issue that in countries is the one of political competition. One reason we find that uh, large metropolitan areas are not adequately governed and their financial structures are not adequately and fully developed is because the central government does not want to build up strong political rivals. And that's been a problem in a great many countries, including my own actually. Uh, and it's a, uh, let me just illustrate the fragmented local government structure issue by looking at the next slide briefly. This is, uh, again, it's just a Canadian example because I have all of this stuff at hand here. This is the, the current city of Toronto is here. You can see this. In, that's, that was the city of Toronto until metropolitan Toronto was formed. And that's uh, this area, the whole thing. I actually live here. I'm right where the arrow is now. As you'll see, the whole metropolitan area is much bigger than the even the expanded city of Toronto. When the city of Toronto was developed, my colleague Enid Slack and I, who wrote this chapter, uh, wrote a paper saying it's both too big and too small. The, this city, this one here, was too big so that the people who were in the previous cities, there were actually uh, not just the six shown here, there were actually uh, nine originally. The people in the original cities did not uh, have any longer have any strong contacts with local government, but also this government was too small to deal with the problems of this area, which is actually the metropolitan region. So it was 
simultaneously too big and too small. Now, uh, one of the solutions to this problem, and the most logical one, is to form a metropolitan regional government. That was not done in our case, essentially for political reasons. Both the provincial politicians did not really want half of the province to be under the control of a single local government, uh, half the province in economic terms, not in geographic terms. Uh, and also, none of the local politicians wanted to lose their jobs running their own turf. So uh, both from below and above, it's very difficult to establish metropolitan regional governments. And apart from the case of South Africa, which was quite unique when it did this, of course, um, there really have not been very many cases of uh, metropolitan regional governments being established on a firm um, institutional and financial base in recent years. The second problem that we have everywhere is, as I mentioned earlier, that we do not price properly. If you charge the wrong prices for urban services, if the, if the price of, uh, let's say, water is exactly the same no matter where you're located, even though it costs twice as much to deliver in some areas than in others, then you're going to distort the direction and development of urban growth. So there's a lot of urban sprawl is a problem. Uh, Washington, D.C., like Toronto, Canada, like most North American cities, exemplify urban sprawl. With the introduction of the automobile at the time those cities were growing, the logical way to expand was outwards. Um, subsequently, they developed high-rise buildings and the downtowns developed, but it was a, a uh, uh, it, it's left with a very sprawling geographic area with the work uh, residence connection having been broken in these cities. It, there are a number of cities in the developing world which are following the same pattern, which is, again reflects in fact, in part, the fact that they don't price properly. Uh, there's also a big problem on the relationships both between the metropolitan region and the rest of the country, the fiscal relationship, and also within the metropolitan region itself, but my time is up. So I will leave that uh, aside and just end with the final statement that I think it, it does not make sense to have a uniform system of local government that, as I said at the beginning, encompasses small villages and very large metropolitan areas and treats them as though they're exactly the same place. A certain degree of asymmetry in terms of giving greater fiscal autonomy and greater fiscal responsibility to larger metropolitan regions than to the rest of uh, other local governments is something that probably we should all be considering carefully. So that's it. Thank you. Victor, over to you. Richard, thank you very much, Richard. So now we have an uh, excellent presentation. You've hit so many of the important issues that, that really uh, trouble us, and we have no solutions. But You've given us some insight, and it'll be a very useful discussion. We're going to go with a one structured question that you actually provided to us, and everyone can vote uh, on the answer, and uh, maybe we can comment on this, and then we have uh, several questions have come in for you, and I'll read them out to you. So we're now getting interaction from our participants for the question, which... Uh, in uh, what way is a metropolitan city uh, most different from other cities? And we're now getting some convergence on the on the response. We'll, uh, we'll we'll lock the answer now, and maybe you can comment on the on the response if you can see it on your screen, Richard. Yes, I can. Well, I think you're quite right. I mean, basically, the reason that we're paying a great deal of attention to this uh, in developing countries at the particular at this particular time is because we have become increasingly aware of the fact that the the future of our economy, of our prosper, prosperity, depends to a large extent upon how well our metropolitan regions do. It's very important economically to every country. Therefore, it's important to uh, uh, look at it separately. Actually, the, the, the way it's most different is probably uh, just that it's a lot bigger. <laughs> but in any case, it's uh, most important economically. I'm interested that absolutely none of you said uh, it's a, uh, it has more autonomy. That actually is not true in all countries. In some countries, particularly those countries where there are metropolitan capital districts or where the capital district is a large city, 
uh, the, the capital district of countries often do have more autonomy. Uh, and then you say it has a larger public sector. I don't quite see why there's a slash no vote there. Uh, it clearly does have a larger public sector than uh, most cities. Um, so I, again, I would have thought that the, the answer should be um, it's different in all of these ways, but probably the most important, as you said, is that it is most important economically. Thank you. Very good, uh, Richard. We have a second question that, that you've actually structured. Uh, should metropolitan cities have more fiscal autonomy than other cities? What, what does the audience think? Please vote and see where we come out on this one. <laughs> We've gotten several questions that we can go to. Uh, is there, maybe, maybe this is not uh, working properly. Looks like you. Well, we seem to have a hundred percent vote in favor of everything, which is where I would vote also. So very, it's a very good group. Yes, <laughs> you think the same way I do. Um, okay, do you want to look at these? specific questions or what? Yeah, yeah. so let's go to the questions, uh, Richard. I mean, let, let me begin by asking everyone to please uh, send all, all of your questions. I think one issue that I wanted to go open up before we begin with the other questions is that we increasingly have this metropolitan or interjurisdictional inter challenge, even in medium and uh, medium-sized cities. So the metropolitan dilemma has come down to not only the big cities but to the fast-growing cities that oftentimes are are middle size and so is getting you know the nature of the problem is is, is increasing tremendously uh, the, the I think one of the the, the the things that resonates incredibly with our audience is this issue that you mentioned so well of you know cities are growing you have to fix the old and expand at the same time and that is the nature of the challenge of our develop of our emerging cities. Uh, we will look later, uh, April 8th, we will look at the issue of how do you finance slum upgrading, which indeed is basically fixing the old. Uh, I think there is consensus now, generally, that the you know, grow now and fix later attitude that has been had in the past is not a good idea. You know, we are, we are leaving cities in a very dysfunctional structure and, and uh, physical structure, and I think this will be uh, addressed then. And um, the fragmentation, the political fragmentation, uh, functional fragmentation, the idea of, of central government not wanting to have political rivals, that we see everywhere. And how, do you, how, how is it possible to, to try to deal with that issue? I think that's a real challenge. Let's go to a couple of questions we received. Uh, uh, some of the characters that have asked the questions are uh, colleagues that you know. Uh, Abdu Mwange asking a question about India. Uh, India has recently witnessed huge growth following this. We have seen a surge in property development in many of India's large megacities. One would assume that we can see property tax as a key source of revenue uh, to finance metro investments. Bangalore has recently done good reforms and demonstrate it is possible, uh, and indeed the use of property tax to generate uh, metropolitan revenues. Uh, other cities, I might add, from my own side, have not been successful. The question from Abdu is, would you recommend that the rest of India learn and uh, indeed replicate examples such as Bangalore uh, on property tax reform? So that's the first question, Richard. Yes, well, uh, actually, Govinda Rao and I recently wrote a paper on uh, governance and uh, finance in India's urban regions. Uh, and I, uh, in that, we say more or less this, that Bangalore has done this so others could do it also. But I do know that there have been, um, let's call them not so successful reforms of property taxes in Delhi and Pune and, and other places in uh, India. One of the things you quickly learn about India is that it is actually a continent, that um, it's a huge place, that all these cities exist in different states, that there are very different problems and uh, possibilities 
facing each of these cities. It's difficult to generalize. Certainly, Bangalore did did some very neat things, and some of them are replicable. I mean, the use of uh, these, uh, you know, the, the photographs and so on, and to to establish the base, the the uh, the moving, um, the simplifying of the system. Uh, well, the state of Karnataka, in which uh, Bangalore is uh, located, has uh, done a uh, more about sort of having a, a better information system than most Indian states. Uh, could you do the same thing in, in some of the other big Indian cities, uh, look now and so on? I think you could do some of it, but certainly it's a good model. Uh, I do think the property tax has uh, suffered a great deal in India because they had adopted a particular form of that tax actually as a result of the earlier British uh, heritage, uh, the, the annual rent approach, I'm not going to get technical, I think McCluskey is going to talk to you about that later, uh, an approach which actually is rather difficult to apply in rapidly growing cities and tends to result in a lot of complications. Uh, and Bangalore sort of changed the system and moved to a different system. Whether you should just emulate it. I don't know. You should certainly learn from it. In fact, I think the Bangalore case is, is interesting in a number of respects because it's true in a number of other countries also. That often when you look around a country, you will find some places are doing some things well. We should learn from these. We should learn from our successes. We, and we see other places haven't done things that well. To take another example from India in a different area, the uh, on uh, urban rapid transit and so on. We have experiences in Delhi and also in, uh, which was it, Emirates are, which, which are quite different. Uh, and, and you could learn, you could learn, or, or no, it was a Medabad. You could learn things from, from these different experiences. I, I'm not sure that there is actually anyone doing this. Uh, many years ago when I worked briefly in the urban division of the bank, I proposed a project called uh, Learning from Success, which would re really have gone around the world and looked at all of these different cities in different countries that even in very adverse circumstances had done a good job uh, and, and try to put together, figure out why it worked in these cases when it didn't work in other cases. Um, like most of my ideas, it didn't really go anywhere, but it's, it's still something we could learn from. Uh, so yes, I, I like very much the idea of taking something that's a success in a country and generalizing it. The people who do this most systematically, although their definition of success is not always identical to mine, are probably the Chinese, who constantly um, pilot things in different regions. And if they seem to work, then they expand them to other parts of the country. But that's done because of the political, particular political structure in China. It's easier to do that. But it's the, the, the method of approaching, of treating the world or your country or different cities as kind of a laboratory in which people are trying things out. And when they work, trying to learn from them and use them elsewhere, that's a very good idea. That's the way we should all approach the world, I think. So excellent comment. Thank you very much, Richard. I think that that's an excellent answer. Just um, I may add a little bit in um, Abdu is working closely on this case, so we're going to ask him to help us disseminate the, the, the lessons. And in, within India, there is, a, there is an attempt, and we're collaborating with the National Institute of Urban Affairs. Um, they have uh, a program called PEARL, uh, the, 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 the part of the acronym which is more, most relevant to us is Reflective Learning, a la Don Sean from uh, the uh, 80s at MIT, which is the idea of, of, the, of the practitioner reflecting and learning about what they're doing. And there is um, a program is part of the India Urban Portal, um, which is now being revised, and we're collaborating with NIUA to actually document these good practices and to and to disseminate them in a compelling way, to actually motivate uh, uh, mo motivate uh, the take up of the experience, so that actually people are are, motiv are motivated to act and not just to reflect. <laughs> so it's kind of a, an actual. Um, a motivator for action. And this is challenging, and this is what the World Bank Institute has been trying to do, and this is what India is trying to do with this new program, um, the PEARL. So we'll see how that goes. Um, let me, uh, a couple more questions. One from um, 
Tommaso uh, Giavacini. Uh, and the question is to Richard, uh, how informal urban growth impacts on revenues in both in terms of user charges and property tax? Uh, might you have poor megacities, is the question uh, from Tommaso. So it's the whole question of informality and growth and how that works within the context of public finance. Tricky question. <laughs> yes, it is a tricky question. There, there's no simple answer to it. Uh, I have a, I did a little work on this, but looking mainly at uh, national level questions thinking we were thinking about substituting the value added tax for the payroll tax in Mexico actually and uh, there, there's a, a, a World Bank sponsored book coming out uh, shortly uh, uh, which has this paper in it on informality and in public finance but I, I think the 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 answer we found is that uh, it's, it's just very complicated um, the the example again uh, a, a good example would be uh, uh, Mumbai, which uh, th there was that famous movie Slumdog M Millionaire. Well, that is a uh, that particular thing is a huge slum. It is true that some people in the slum are actually millionaires, uh, but it, it's a um, if you look at that, um, it's very easy to throw up your hands in despair. On the other hand, you can look at it and say, my goodness, uh, you know, people can succeed in any circumstances. But the question actually is, how does the city um, relate to that? Well, usually the traditional way, and I think Mila is going to talk about this to some extent, the, the traditional idea of the, the kind of elite people and well-off people who decided these things in most countries was to get rid of the slums. You know, you get rid of that dis disorderly, chaotic, uh, market, uh, you know, regulate it, uh, control it, uh, all that kind of stuff. We now think that's really not the way to go about it. You've got to start with what you have and build build up from it. I, I think your your the previous point you mentioned about the uh, the very well named pearl in uh, India. You know, a pearl starts as an irritant. It's a it's a grain of sand in a clam or something like that, or an oyster, and and with time. Uh, and development, it changes into a thing of beauty. And I think that's actually uh, what we're looking at here. If we look at this whole question of informal economic growth, it, for those who aren't taking part in it, it can be seen as an irritant, something to be gotten rid of. For those who are taking part in it, it can be seen as chaos and something they want to get out of. Uh, but actually, there's an enormous amount of creative innovation going on, driven by the need for survival and for improvement within those communities. And if one can somehow harness and make use of that. Now, from a public finance point of view, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. There, there are two things mentioned specifically, user charges and property tax. Well, one of the characteristics of uh, slums, for example, is that they don't have adequate public services. Uh, if they have uh, water, uh, they probably have to carry it a long way or they it's not clean water. If they have electricity, they probably have to steal it off the lines, uh, you know, put a you know, it, it, illegal tap in. Uh, it has been found that uh, providing water and electricity uh, is, a, is a, a way of improving life, improving productivity, uh, improving service to people who don't live in these areas. It's, it's just an all-around winner that uh, providing, well, but on the other hand, how, how can they pay for it? Well, you can work out systems. I think one thing that you learn very quickly is that it makes no sense to come down from on high, so to speak, and give people things. If people really want things and you can help them to work to get those things and provide some assistance to them in doing it, but they actually make a contribution to it, it's theirs. They have ownership. They look after it. So there's really... User charges are actually a good thing if they're properly uh, done. Similarly with property taxes, the big problem in a lot of slums is there's no, um, no ownership. Uh, there's no incentive to do anything because if you, if you improve your property, uh, the person who, uh, somebody else can just take it away from you. So the whole question of the legal structure, this is, goes back to the work of Hernando de Soto and so on and others and informal development. Uh, 
there is a, a, a lot to be said for trying to establish more formal market structures, but not by regulation from above, but rather by building on the structure that's there. But to do any of these things, you have to actually know how these communities work. Uh, uh, in the case of, uh, uh, again, in the, in the uh, slum case in, in Brazil, there, there's interesting examples of where uh, with the cooperation of the community, certain communities have been turned around to a great, to a considerable extent with the assistance of the local government. Instead of becoming enemies, they began to work together for the common good. That's the sort of ideal. The, the simple answer is that informal urban growth can be a real trouble. Uh, it provides no revenue directly. Uh, it seems to cause demand for new expenditures, and that's why a lot of people don't like it. But it also provides the foundation for building the city, an, an inclusive city that encompasses more of the population, and which, but they should also be made to feel part of the community by paying for whatever they get. But then they must get something for what they pay, and that's the, the other side of the problem. So there's no easy solutions here. In fact, that that's one good way to begin to approach the whole problem of metropolitan growth in developing countries, this question of how you the uh, informal becomes formal. Uh, it's a problem we approach from many different regions in terms of business license and regulation, provision of urban services, establishment of these uh, uh, charging and taxing systems, the uh, community-based uh, uh, decisions on different issues. There's no one answer, and it's, there's not an answer that can be developed uh, from anywhere else and adopted uh, without a lot of adjustment to particular circumstances. So basically it's a it's fundamentally a political problem, um, but it's a uh, uh, it, it's a good way of thinking about the whole problem. I, I think we we uh, we have found one of the interesting things if you look at the development of big cities in in our uh, in many countries, what you'll find is the rich originally lived in the center, then they moved to the outside, and now in the developed countries, they've moved back into the center. Uh, so that the what happened is the poor areas were on the fringes, then the poor areas became in the center, and now at the present time in North America, the poor areas are actually neither the center nor the fringes, but the, inter, the part in between. Uh, and uh, so you've seen this pattern over 200 years of the, the, the um, there's always inequality but the spatial location of it and how that part interacts with the rest of the city has changed enormously over time. And the, uh, it's a uh, uh, it's always easier to deal with these problems when you have growth and a growth dividend that you can use to uh, help structure and shape the growth of the community as a whole. But there's no easy, you, know, you guys are thinking of hard things. So the, this informal question is a good one. I don't have a good answer. And you can certainly have poor mega cities. In fact, at the moment, thank you very much, Richard. I, th I think you did have a good answer. As a matter of fact, excellent. And I think uh, it really a, a couple of uh, um, advertisements. So April eighth, we will have Mila Freire going over the chapter on financing slum upgrading. It's an excellent chapter, uh, and I think you will in, um, provide a little bit of a deeper discussion on this. Uh, and also, uh, my colleague Andre Herzog is now. Uh, preparing a course on, on slum upgrading, which includes the issue of financing. So the World Bank will be able to have some structured learning about around this most challenging uh, issue. Let me read the next couple of questions together, uh, Richard. We have about uh, uh, five minutes. Um, uh, one is uh, uh, from Simeon in Kashimana. And let me sort of compose that a little bit. He, he talks about the municipal, if a municipal government, uh, in this case metropolitan, can introduce uh, something on the cost and quality of services in order to uh, minimize uh, expenditures and increase revenue. So I guess the whole issue of indicators and, 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 uh, and performance indicators in order to ensure that, that uh, the quality of services reflect what you're spending. Uh, another question uh, from uh, Matthew Glasser um, in a statement. Uh, he mentions, the question of borrowing autonomy depends in part on the legal framework for local government. If cities have a reasonable degree of control over their own revenues or stable and predictable transfers, then relatively autonomous borrowing makes sense. 
But if cities have few authorized revenue sources, are subsidiary governance and policies to higher levels, then autonomous borrowing can be dangerous. And uh, our colleague Abdu has sent a couple of clarifications that you can read, uh, everyone can read on their screen uh, uh, to go further in depth on the case of India. So those two points, Richard, on uh, the issue of uh, uh, quality measures on service provision, and then Matthew Glasser's reflection on, on credit. Well, actually, the easier one to deal with is Matthew's comment. The, the, uh, he's quite right. Uh, one of the reasons we, we, while there have been relatively few problems at the local level, there have certainly been problems at the regional level uh, with subnational borrowing in, in several Latin American countries and elsewhere. And one of the uh, the principal reasons was exactly what he says that that basically uh, you you uh, did not uh, they were able to spend without uh, having to be accountable for what they were spending on or for beating the the uh, the debts that they they were incurring they knew that others would save them and they did so there is a uh, a problem. It, uh, we, there's a general proposition which applies at the national as well as at the subnational level that it, unless you have a certain degree of revenue autonomy, you're, an ability to expand your revenues if you need to do so to meet expenditures, a certain degree of revenue autonomy, you, you can, cannot and should not borrow. That's quite right. Um, however, one of the major points I would make about metropolitan finance is metropolitan governments really should be responsible for most of their own uh, uh, expenditures, responsible for financing most of their own expenditures, and they should also have the capacity to, um, you know, deal with credit markets and all those sorts of things. Now, if, if, but, you know, there are many countries in which credit markets are not well developed. There are lots of problems with uh, credit ratings and so on. There are lots of difficulties in knowing exactly who is liable for debts in case there are failures. There are all kinds of difficulties with borrowing, but still, that's a, a, a it's certainly something the bank and fund have been very concerned with, and there's a lot of advice on what to do on that. The, the more interesting question and more general question is the one that uh, Simeon mentioned. In fact, I see he wrote another note here, so I'll just look out. Uh, yes, well, the idea of a cost to quality system uh, is to uh, improve expenditures. Yeah, I, I once wrote a paper in India years ago, if I recall, which said something like, we're talking too much about raising revenues to meet expenditure needs. Why don't we talk about spending more efficiently so that we don't need so much revenue? And he's sort of saying the same thing. Well, the question is spending efficiently, spending properly, uh, providing quality as well as quantity and services. Th these are all questions that are very important when it comes to assessing uh, or measuring the, the fiscal health of municipalities. And uh, my colleague, the, the one I wrote the book, uh, that chapter within this book, and I are now editing a book on measuring urban fiscal health. We're focusing on, on developed countries, but the the issues that come up are very um, are, are universal. It, the idea that the a higher level government establishes service standards norms that have to be satisfied by lower level governments is not a bad idea. It can be used in a bad way, but it's something that most countries, in fact, do. Uh, the, uh, we have 39 performance standards, which the province imposes on local governments in, in uh, this province, for example. Uh, about 35 of them make sense, and about four don't. But they're, they're certainly to be expected. I mean, they're, they are things that say, for example, uh, you're responsible for building a school. If you build a school, the school must have the following conditions, so much uh, you know, floor space, so much uh, ventilation, uh, so much heating, so many safety features, uh, you know, stuff like that. So there's a whole set of regulations that apply uh, governing municipal structures. There are also lots of uh, regulations that govern the way in which service standards are uh, implemented with respect to the uh, provision of social services, education, health, uh, all these kinds of things. Countries in Europe, like uh, Denmark, uh, have very uh, detailed discussions with local levels and develop these standards jointly, not rather than just imposing them from above. But in most cases, they're, they're just developed above. Uh, 
they're often used to control local spending uh, or as the bureaucrats at the center would put it to ensure that those fellows down there who don't know what they're doing don't do anything that's too bad and and that's an attitude I don't have much sympathy with the the people down below are the people who have to do these things you, you have to work with people uh, and not just regulate them running a government is not like running an army you you have uh, people who are independent decision makers and you have to get them to agree with what you're doing is sensible and show them how to do it and support them in doing it so the standards alone without an information system uh, that tells you what they're actually doing and without a capacity building system that enables them to fulfill it and without a support system that enables them to do it are not enough so it's part of a, an overall system of improving local governance but it isn't enough by itself that would be my view I think we're out of time now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. That was really excellent. I mean, really illuminating. And and if if the analogy of the pearl being an irritant and then being beautiful, uh, you you were just uh, a diamond. <laughs> no, you didn't go through any phases. Lots of uh, wisdom, and I hope that everyone is able to to read in the chapter the details of, of what you've uh, presented. Uh, any any final words that you'd like to say before we say goodbye, Richard? Uh, yes. You know, a diamond is, is just a lump of coal that's been put under a lot of pressure. Uh, you put me under a little pressure, so I hope I sparkled a teeny bit. Anyway, thank you very much. It's been fun. Thank you very much, Richard. No, uh, I, I, I mean it. I think we have a, you have a tremendous amount of, of, of wisdom, and I hope that everyone benefited. I'm sure they did. We have... Um, Next week, uh, March uh, 11th, uh, Debbie Wetzel will be presenting the case of uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, we hope that everyone it will be a very uh, interesting uh, and uh, provocative look at, uh, at the Sao Paulo region. Um, uh, on uh, March 25th, we have the issue of capital finance uh, with uh, uh, Greg Ingram, uh, President of the, the Lincoln Land Institute. April 1st, we have uh, property tax. Uh, and we, critical in the, in the, in the puzzle of, of uh, metropolitan finance, we hope that everyone can join us. April 8th, we will be looking at uh, slum upgrading and how to finance that. So we have a rich agenda ahead of us. I want to thank Richard again for the excellent presentation. Everyone that participated for all your beautiful questions. And uh, and we look forward to seeing you again. We'll now go through an evaluation, and um, please join us next time. Thank you very much.